So you've learned about one kind of nerve signal, the idea of a graded potential. We talked about how that might occur, for example, if we had a bunch of closed sodium channels here and opened them with a ligand that they responded to, we could cause a temporary change in membrane potential, a ripple, that could spread along this membrane, maybe down the dendrite, maybe even into the cell body. But we mentioned that they don't spread very far. If that's a big graded potential, it might spread even through the cell body, but take a look at the length of that axon. There's no way that graded potential is going to be able to get down to the end of that axon. That axon could be anywhere from millimeters to a meter long. So even if I started a big graded potential right here next to the axon, it's just not going to get that far. So if I want this cell to be able to send a signal down at these axon terminals, the idea of a neurocrine transmission, how am I going to get a signal down that far? Well, we mentioned at the end of the last lecture the idea that the problem with graded potentials is that they die out. But if you could imagine something which would restart a graded potential periodically, then really it could just keep going. So we need to think of a way that that could work. What I've got here, if I've got a depolarizing graded potential, what I want is some way for that graded potential to trigger another graded potential. Now this one, this graded potential started when I opened some channels with, say, a ligand. So we had a chemically gated ion channel. What I need is a way for the graded potential, which is a change in voltage, to start another graded potential by opening a channel. And you remember when we talked about channel gating, we talked about how there are some channels which are voltage gated. In other words, they open or close by changes in voltage. So if we had a channel which would open when that graded potential hit it, that would, could cause another graded potential, which could then trigger the opening of other voltage gated channels, which would cause another graded potential, and so on. In that way, you might be able to get a signal that could go for any distance. There's an analogy for this which works pretty well, which is, you've, you're probably familiar with it. If you've been to a sports stadium, you've probably seen people do the wave. So you remember that one person will go, yeah, and then the person next to them will see them do that and go, yeah, and then the person next to them, yeah, and so on down. Uh, you can find videos of this online if you've never seen it. What you get is then a bunch of people in the stadium all going, yeah, and that makes the next people go, yeah, and yeah, and that just progresses around the stadium. Now, if you've seen it happen, you've se you may have seen it go around a stadium several times. Here's the question. What's the limit on how far the wave can go? And I think the answer would be, there is no limit as long as there are people there who will keep doing it. And the reason for that is, it's different from me saying, when I shout, there's no limit to how far the sound spreads. That's not true. It dies out after a while. But if I shout, and someone else then shouts because of that, and someone else shouts because of that, it can go forever because we're renewing the shout. Likewise, with the wave, when I do yay this, the person next to me doesn't say, okay, but I'll only do it half that much. Yay! And the person says, oh, okay, half. Yay! Yeah. And so on. Then it would die out. But each person does their own wave. So in the, because of that, it doesn't get any smaller. Each person's wave, though, is not the thing that's spreading. What you're spreading is triggering waves. So each person does their own little yay wave, and that triggers the next yay of the same size. In the same way, if I could set this up so that a graded potential here triggered another graded potential here, which triggered one here, which triggered one here, we would keep this effect going. In a way, it would almost be more like the graded potential gets boosted, gets renewed. So we cause a wave in membrane potential that spreads, and then we open more channels, which renews it, and it spreads and dies off, and we open more channels, which renews it, and so on. We just keep it going. That concept is the idea of an action potential. An action potential. An action potential is a set of changes that take place 
at one particular location on the membrane. So I could look at a spot and say an action potential happens there. And that action potential can trigger other action potentials at nearby sets of membrane. So this can trigger action potentials at nearby locations. So that's one way to think of it. An action potential is a set of things that happen here that can trigger another action potential here, that triggers one here, that triggers one here, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. And that can go as long as there's membrane that can have action potentials. Another way of thinking of it is that we have something where a graded potential arrives at this spot on the membrane, which triggers a set of things which boost that graded potential so that it can get to the next spot which triggers a set of things, an action potential, which boosts it so it gets to the next spot. So you could also think of it as action potentials being boosts to a graded potential that keeps that graded potential going. Either way you think of it as good. They both work. So what we need to talk about is what are those sets of changes? What do we need to have happen? And just like we were just talking, this is going to be based on the idea of voltage-gated channels. We need something so that when a graded potential arrives at a certain location, it triggers the opening of a voltage-gated channel, which will boost it, causing this set of action potential changes, which amplifies the graded potential, allowing it to go to the next spot, where it will trigger more voltage-gated channels, which will renew it and send it on to the next spot, and so on. So let's talk about how that's going to work. Oh, actually, before we do that, let's talk about where it happens. Now graded potentials, all those need is opening and closing ion channels of some sort. So those are happening everywhere. The whole cell is at resting membrane potential. And here in the dendrites and cell body, we have the kind of channels that respond to, st to stimuli from outside, like chemical signals from other cells, that cause graded potentials, depolarizing or hyperpolarizing, either way that then spread out and add together as they meet with other graded potentials in this area. The thing that's different starting here at the axon hillock and all the way down the axon is that from here on, we also have voltage-gated channels that can, have, that can support action potentials. I can't technically say we don't have voltage-gated channels back in this area, because that wouldn't be true. But we don't usually have action potentials back here. This area, we have graded potentials adding together, affecting each other. And then what matters is, all of those together, is that enough to trigger an action potential here? And if it is, the action potential we trigger here at the axon hillock will trigger additional action potentials, and they will propagate, the word we use is propagate, reproduce each other all the way down the axon, however long that is. So let's talk about the voltage-gated channels that we find here in the hillock and in the axon and see how they make action potentials. So let's erase this, bam, and talk about action potentials and voltage-gated channels. There are two kinds of voltage-gated channels we need to talk about. The first one is the, I'll just abbreviate voltage-gated as VG, sodium channel. The cartoon I usually use for this looks like this. I draw it like a regular channel with a gate, but it has something else on it, this little dangly bit. This is probably similar to how it actually physically works. Technically, the voltage-gated sodium channel has two aspects where it can open and close. It has an internal gate, and it has a plug that's sometimes called the inactivation gate.
The internal gate, this one, is actually realistically probably more like the channel popping open or pinching shut. So it goes from closed to open to closed. In addition to that, we have the plug. So it really can be open, closed, or open, but plugged. So you can see that here, sodium could pass through it. Here, sodium could not. And here, sodium could not. In order for sodium to pass, it has to be open and unplugged. So that means it kind of has three states it can be in. Closed but unplugged, open and unplugged, and open and plugged. We can think of it with those three states like this. It can be closed, it can be open, and it can be plugged, which the better term is inactivated. So these are the three states this channel can be in. <clears throat> now, it can switch from one state to the other, but for, um, this is slightly simplified, but for our purposes, that switch can only go in one direction. It can go from closed to open. It can go from this unplugged to this unplugged. It can go from open to inactivated. It can go open and unplugged to open and plugged. And it can go from inactivated to regular closed. From, pl from plugged to closed. But it can't go backwards. Again, simplified, but for our purposes, it doesn't seem to be able to go from just open to closed. It, if it's open, the next thing it can be is inactivated. If it's inactivated, it cannot just open. It has to go to closed first. Now, note, both of these states don't allow sodium flow. Only when it's in this state can sodium flow through it. The reason this is different is that if I'm inactivated, I can't just go back to open. I have to go through the regular closed state. So let's talk about when, what makes it go from one state to the next. If it's closed, the thing that will make it open is if the membrane potential goes above, that is more positive than, negative 55 millivolts. There, this is just a characteristic of how the channel works. The way this protein is constructed, that's about the membrane potential where it will switch from closed to open. Technically speaking, we would say we would more, most accurately say that's when its probability of opening starts to increase. So you could say if it's closed and the membrane potential is below negative 55, so if on our voltage chart, here's zero, here's rest, and here's negative 55. We could say, if it's closed and we're at rest, the chance of it opening is very, very, very low. If I bring it up to negative 55, the chance of it opening starts to rise. And pretty quickly, once I get above negative 55, the chance of a channel opening gets pretty high. So it's very likely that they will open. And the more positive it gets, the more likely it is. Now this leads to an interesting effect. Imagine I've got a whole bunch of closed channels at resting membrane potential. And I get the membrane potential just to negative 55. So the chance of them opening becomes, there starts to be a chance. So imagine I've got like a hundred of them on here. They're all closed and then I hit negative 55 and one of them just goes pop open for a moment. Now when that opens, sodium comes in, brings the cell closer to ENA which increases the chance that others will open. So one goes pop, and that makes a couple more go pop, pop, which makes the chance, which makes the membrane more positive, which makes the chance for more of them to open. So pop, 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 pop. So just one or two of them opening leads to this thing where it gets more positive, so more of them open, pop, 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 which, so it gets more positive, so more of them open, pop, 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 and so on. It's a chain reaction. In a way, it's a positive feedback loop. We open one, which causes a change, which causes more to open, which causes a change, which causes more to open. It's a, it's a runaway chain reaction. In any case, what that means is that if I get the membrane above negative 55, pretty quickly, all these channels are going to go from closed to open. Pop, 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 pop. And the whole set of them is open, and now sodium is rushing in through a whole bunch of new channels, which means the membrane potential is going to rise fast. 
We'll get back to that. So going, if I get the membrane potential above negative 55, a lot of these channels switch from closed to open. So what makes them go from open to inactivated? As it turns out, that plug will swing shut when the membrane potential is above negative 55 millivolts for about half 0.5 a millisecond, half of a thousandth of a second. So notice this is very strange. When I get above negative 55, these channels start going pop, 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 opening, which keeps me positive. But then when I've been above negative 55 for half a millisecond, all of them start going thump and plugging themselves. So it's like we open them and then they plug themselves in half a millisecond. That feels very strange. If I had a gate, in, a door in my house that worked that way, that, well, I can open it, but half a millisecond later, it's going to plug itself, that wouldn't seem like a very good door. That would be something which could only be opened for a very short time. As it turns out, that's exactly what I want, but we'll get to that. And then once it's inactivated, once it's plugged, how can we get it to go back to closed? Because once it's plugged, I can't open it again until it goes back to here. Even if I go right below negative 55, it's not immediately going to go back to open. I have to get it into this state first. I have to get the plug out, and then it's available to open again. What makes the plug come out? Well, once it's inactivated, to go from here to here, I have to be below negative 55 for about half a millisecond. So once I have activated the channels, so they all pop open, and then that brings my membrane potential up, and then they, then they plug themselves half a millisecond later, in order to get them back to closed, I have to bring the membrane potential back down below this point and keep it there for half a millisecond for those plugs to come out. If I do that, then they go back to closed. And then the next time I get above negative 55, they can open again. This is sort of like a reset mechanism. It's a little bit like, it's almost like a circuit breaker. You trigger it, it shuts off, and in order to make it work again, you have to go out there and reset it manually. Here, I trigger the channels, they open, and they stay open for half a millisecond, and then they plug themselves, and in order for them to be available again, I have to reset this thing. So what good is this channel? Well, imagine I've got a bit of membrane with this, and a graded potential. I'm sitting at rest at negative 70, and a graded potential arrives, and it's enough to bring this up above negative 55, that's going to trigger these channels to open. And when they open, a bunch of sodium is going to come in and boost that graded potential. Let's draw that out. So here I am. Here's negative 70, resting membrane potential. Here's negative 55. If a graded potential comes along and brings this membrane with these channels up to negative 55, it's going to trigger the opening of those sodium channels, which is going to let a bunch of sodium in and very rapidly make the membrane potential big. Take that, that graded potential and add on to it. It's generally going to rise to about positive 30. So a big change. So I've boosted my signal. My greater potential got there, and I said, go, boom, and I made it much bigger. So now I need to reset this membrane. Now, in order so I can do this again the next time a greater potential gets here, I now have to bring the membrane potential back down. How do I do that? Yes, I plugged them here, but that just stops the extra sodium coming in. It will, under those circumstances, it would gradually drift back down to rest. But I want to bring it back down quickly. So how do I do that? Well, we're going to need another voltage-gated channel. So keep all of your notes for this, and now let's add on the second kind of channel, which is a little bit simpler. Let's add in the voltage-gated potassium channel. This one doesn't have the plug. So this one really just has two states, open and closed. 
The reason it's special is that it's slow to open and close. So let's take our two states, closed and open. This channel will go from closed to open. If it's closed, it will pop open when the membrane potential has been above negative 55 millivolts for about half a millisecond. And it will go from open to closed when the membrane potential is below negative 55 millivolts for half a millisecond. So once I get the membrane potential up above that negative 55, that point where all this happens, if I keep it there for half a millisecond, these channels will open. Remember, potassium tries to go out. Its concentration gradient is outward. So as positive potassium goes out, the inside becomes more negative. This will now bring the membrane potential down closer to EK. And once it gets below negative 55 millivolts for half a millisecond, these then close off, so no more potassium leaves. But that's what I needed to reset the membrane. So this is the reset channel. The sodium channel is the boost. We trigger that, we go, bam, sodium comes in, boost that graded potential, which then leads to these being open, which says, potassium leave, bring the membrane potential back down. And then these have closed themselves, the sodium channels reset, and we're ready to go again. It's a really a very clever mechanism. Let's put it together and see if we can make it work. So keep your notes available for both of those. And let's see if we can predict how this is going to work. Let's draw, let's make a note that we have a membrane that has some voltage gated sodium channels and some voltage gated potassium channels. Let's chart the membrane potential at this little bit of membrane. So here's zero, here's positive 60, that's ENA. So here's negative 90, that's EK. Which means there's negative 55. negative 70. All right. So negative 70 is resting membrane potential. So that's where we're going to start. I'm just going to sketch a line across here at negative 55 because that, remember, is where a lot of the important things happen. We're going to call that threshold. So we start out in this initial state, voltage-gated sodium channels are closed, voltage-gated potassium channels are closed, which means the only channels that are open right now are those simple leak channels that we find all over the membrane, which is why we're at resting membrane potential. Now, now we have to imagine that a graded potential comes to this part of the membrane. Somewhere over there, we opened some sodium channels and we got sodium rushing in and other positive ions bumping their way down this way and they get bumped under this part of the membrane. So they make the inside here more positive. So I'm now bringing my membrane potential up. Now, just as don't take this note, just listen to this. If it didn't get to threshold, if it was just a small graded potential, what happens? Nothing. That's not enough to get these sodium channels to open, so it behaves like any other graded potential and just dies out. It's still going on, getting smaller as it goes. But what if it's enough to get us up to negative 55? Well, when it does that, some of the sodium channels start to open. So we'll make a note of this here at location two. Sodium channels open. And as they open, sodium flows in, 
which makes the membrane more positive, which opens more sodium channels, which makes more sodium flow in, and we get this rapid depolarization up to somewhere around positive 30, typically. And it's very fast. There's a lot of, these channels are generally densely packed. So what we've effectively done is just open a whole bunch of sodium channels and whomp, in comes this big flow of sodium and this part of the membrane is now quite positive on the inside. Okay, so that, let's make a note of how long this takes. So, this stuff will be able to keep coming in for about half a millisecond. And now think about what happens when VM has been above negative 55 millivolts for half a second. Look at your two channels and think about what happens. The sodium channels were closed. Now they, they opened when VM got above negative 55. Now VM has been above negative 55 for half a millisecond. What happens to the sodium channels? Well, that meets the conditions for them to go from open to inactivated. So all those sodium channels, which were open, now go plug, which means we cut off that sodium flow. So we're no longer getting pulled up. And about the same time, my potassium channels have now been above negative 55 for half a millisecond. So they open up. So my, this is what my channels are now doing. Sodium channels are plugged, potassium channels have opened. When the potassium channels open, potassium starts flowing out of the cell. Positive ions going out make the inside more negative or pulls us down toward EK. So my membrane potential starts to drop fast. So it gets down toward rest. Now, resting membrane potential is where I go when I have the leak sodium and the leak potassium channels open. Remember about 40 times more leak potassium than leak sodium. Those are still here, but I also still have my voltage gated potassium channels. So now I've got both the leak potassium channels and the voltage gated ones, which means I've got a lot more potassium channels than normal, which means I'm not gonna stop at rest. I'm gonna drop somewhat below resting membrane potential. Not all the way to EK, but closer than usual. But half a millisecond after I got down below negative 55, what's going to happen? Well, let's think. As I dropped down here, when I went below negative 55 in the first place, what happened? Look at the two channels, nothing in particular. But half a millisecond after I dropped below it, two things will happen. My sodium channels go from inactivated, plugged, back to closed. That doesn't really have any effect here because sodium still can't flow through them, but it will be important in a little bit. My potassium channels start to go from open back to closed. We should take some more notes here. So back here, position three. That was when my sodium channels inactivated and my potassium channels open. Nothing particular happened here, but here at four, sodium channels go to closed. Remember, they were effectively closed here. They're just in that special inactivated, plugged kind of closed. This is just regular closed. And the potassium channels close. Once those extra potassium channels close, that means I am going to gradually return back up to resting membrane potential. That is an action potential. Let's make a few more notes. This part, the rapid depolarization, this is from sodium inflow. This part, the repolarization and hyperpolarization, 
is from potassium outflow. So this was our boost that added to the graded potential. And note, that is now moving on. Here at this part of the membrane, we are now resetting it, bringing the membrane potential back down under negative 55, and then letting it return to rest. That's going to reset those sodium channels so that now they are back to just regular closed, not inactivated. So that if another graded potential gets here, I can do this again. If I tried to trigger one too soon, I couldn't do it because my sodium channels would be inactivated. And that is actually an important point. So, make, make sure that you understand what happened here. Make sure you could explain what the state of the channels is in each of these periods. What's going on with them here, 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 all of those. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. The action potential is also difficult. So, work on it a little bit. Practice with some questions on it. Now, before we end this, I do want to talk a little bit about that idea I just mentioned about how soon could we trigger another one. Take a look at the sodium channels. The thing that made the action potential happen was getting us above negative 55 so my sodium channels could open. Think about what would happen if I tried to do that here. If I just magically took this membrane potential and went bop up to threshold. Would I get another action potential? The answer is no. My sodium channels inactivated here. This was half a millisecond after threshold, so now they're plugged. They're not going to unplug again until here. So during this period, from where they plug to where they unplug, they're in their inactivated state, and I cannot make them open. We have a name for that. This period between the time that they get plugged and the time where the plugs come out, we call the absolute refractory period. Some people will also include this part here while the action potential is starting. It's fine with me if you do, but really the important part is that it's while the sodium channels are plugged. Here, they're already open, so it wouldn't matter if we tried to open them. but. During this part, they can't be opened because they're plugged. During that time, we cannot start a new action potential at this part on the membrane. So then there's this period between the time that the absolute refractory period ends and we return back to rest. During that time, from here to here. The sodium channels are available. They're just back in their regular closed state. But it's harder than usual for me to get to threshold. Here, I only have to go up 15 millivolts. Here, it might be 25 millivolts. So during that time, I would need a bigger than usual graded potential to get this thing to trigger a new action potential. We call that, that the relative refractory period. That's the time when it's a little harder than usual to trigger a new action potential. It's possible that it takes a bigger stimulus. The relevance of those, why do you need to know about those? Okay, keep this diagram in your notes, and I'm going to erase this and start and draw something else. All right. Let's imagine that we're here at the axon hillock of this neuron. So graded potentials coming in here have been enough to bring the membrane here up to threshold, which means we trigger an action potential. So the memory potential here starts to go up and sodium ions are coming in. we boosted that graded potential. So now, yes, some of those sodium ions actually do go backward. Um, it's not, that actually probably does have relevance, but we're ignoring it for now. And some of them are moving on down. And as they go down, 
they trigger an action potential here. They bring this part of the membrane up to threshold. So now this starts up. And this one's still in having its action potential. So now these sodium ions coming at this part go in both directions. Some of them also go backward. Why doesn't that trigger another action potential here? The answer is, this is still in its absolute refractory period. It's still in the middle of having its action potential. So next moment in time, this is now starting on its downslope. This is in the middle of letting in a bunch of sodium ions. And now this part is starting to have its action potential. These ions coming in here are still moving back here, but they can't trigger an action potential here because we're in our absolute refractory period. These sodium channels are plugged, but they can trigger one here. And as that one's heading up, new ions are coming in. Next moment, this is still coming down. This one's just hitting its peak. So these are now no longer coming in so much, but this is right in the middle of it, so it's triggering another action potential here. These are coming backward, but these two are still in their absolute refractory period, so they can't have a new one. You get the idea. By the time this part is out of its absolute refractory period and ready to have another action potential, all the action is going on down here. That's too far for this effect to sweep backward. So effectively, this is like saying, Imagine that we were going to try to do the wave at a sports stadium. And my instructions are, if somebody next to me does the wave, I should do the wave too. So if this person goes, yay, I'm going to go, okay, yay, and the person says, oh, somebody's doing it, yay, and so on. So here's the problem. They go, yay, and I say, okay, someone next to me is doing the wave. So I go, yay, and that person next to me says, okay, yay, and I say, hey, look, they're doing the wave, yay, and they say, oh, they're doing the wave, yay, and all of us notice they're like, ah all the time because someone's always doing the wave. That doesn't work very well. Instead, now imagine that when we do the wave, we have a period where we get tired and won't do it again. So now the wave looks like, yeah, ugh. Okay, I'm ready. So now here's how it works. That's our absolute refractory period. Person goes, yay, and I say, oh, person next to me is doing the wave, yay, and the, this person says, next to me is doing the wave, yay. So now they went, yeah, and I go, yeah, and they're going, ugh, and I'm going, yeah, and they start going, yeah, and I'm going, well, someone's next to me, but I'm tired, ugh, and they're going, yeah, and the person next to them says, yeah, and then I get out of my tired, but now they're tired, and I say, okay, and I look around me, and no one's doing the wave, so I say, okay, I'll wait till the next one, and now so another one comes around, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, ugh, yeah, yeah, ugh. The absolute refractory period prevents action potentials from normally going backward. Unless you triggered one here. So think about that. Imagine going back to our thing where we do, yay, ugh. But now instead of starting over there, someone starts it here. They go, yay. And now the people on either side of them, actually, let's help us start it. We go out of nowhere, not triggered by anything. We just go, yay. Now the person here says, Yay! And the person on the other side of me says, Yay! And the action potential starts going both ways. Each of them goes, Yay! Ugh! But then the person on the other side of them goes, Yay! Ugh! And I get action potentials going both directions. That can actually happen. If, ignoring all this, I start an action potential partway down an axon, it will actually propagate in both directions. You can observe this in a lab. But normally we trigger it here which means it only propagates down the axon. That's the typical pattern. Alrighty, good job. Action potentials are difficult. If that all made sense to you, then you're in great shape. If it didn't quite make sense, that's not a bad thing. That just means you gotta go back over it a few times. And again, best thing you can do is look at it, try write down notes, try to write it in your own words, Try and explain it, and then try to explain it to me. Even when you know you can't, explain whatever you can. Do not be embarrassed. That's how you learn. Sometimes we get the impression that if I don't get this the first time, I must be stupid. Absolutely not. You don't, nobody gets this the first time, not completely anyway. 
this takes time. So do not be embarrassed to keep trying it. You will learn it. Everybody can get this. All right, good job. Uh, next thing we're going to talk about will be how, how this signal actually propagates down here, some things that change it, and what happens when we get to the end. So that's going to come in the next lecture. See you then.